Hello, everyone. Welcome to this special CUBE conversation. I'm John Furrier, the host of the CUBE, co-founder of SiliconANGLE Media. We're here in our Palo Alto studios for the CUBE, talking about cloud computing and all the greatness around what's happening in tech. We're here with a practitioner who's also the CTO and, and lead engineering manager executive. His name's Dan Drew. He's with DigiTV. Um, they're a hot startup that's growing, doing a unique solution around changing the game and opening up uh, TV for the masses. Uh, great, great opportunity. Thanks for joining me. Thanks for having me. So one of the things I love about what you guys are doing is you guys are a startup that's challenging the status quo with TV, taking over the air in cities and having a, an app where you can watch TV without having to literally right. cut in a cord. Right. Um, and so it's challenging, but there's some technical things that require cloud. You guys are growing, you're a user of cloud. Um, What's the, how are you looking at building out the engineering team? Because you're, you're DevOps, you've been doing DevOps from day one, but you have to have local presences in these, in these yeah. markets. You have a data center in each market, plus you get cloud, you're a hybrid. Right, exactly. Um, well, I mean, for us the cloud is uh, essential because we have, even though we have to have a local presence for each of these markets, because uh, we're obviously receiving local signals and we can only do that you know, in the market. You, know, you can't receive an LA signal in Boston, right? So we have the local presence, but at the same time, um, we want to have all of our central stuff managed in a much more effective way, in a central way that we mm -hmm. can scale as we grow. Right, so as we continue to add markets across the country, uh, which we hope to do very quickly, uh, we want to make sure that the, the central services that manage you know, all the things that are common and the apps uh, can grow and hopefully grow as automatically and as scalably as we can and uh, we can most effectively accomplish that by leveraging cloud technologies. Just to get the idea um, straightened out so we can kind of get to the cloud stuff, is you guys are taking over the air TV, which is free, yes. the old antenna days, yes. and then we're without cable, and there's channels that are available for free, um, and then putting that into a local region, so LA, Phoenix, San Francisco, Boston, they have their local broadcast over the air, you bring it in, yep. and then it's digital. Yes. And then the users access it via apps, and all the things that connect at the, in the edge of the home. That's right. That's pretty much the general That's right. concept. Yeah. Uh, so basically what we do is we allow you to get all those things without having to worry about an antenna on your house or if you're yeah. mobile or you know, whatever. So like a lot of people these days might just get a Roku and not want to worry about a physical antenna or whether you're pointing in the right direction or whether there's some other house in the way. Yeah. Um, and so we allow them to get the over the air channels at high quality no matter where they are without having to worry about sort yeah. of the antenna. Part of the problem. It's a great right. mission, I love it. The, it's ambitious, a lot of moving parts. You have content, you got transmission, but it really opens up freedom for people, whole new demographics, yeah. great stuff. So, so okay, now how do you make this happen? You got to go deploy cloud, so you obviously want to use the most efficient. You guys are lean and mean, you don't have a huge IT staff, it's you and a, a couple of people, yes. basically you. Yeah, we have a two person <laughs> ops staff and, and me and some <laughs> engineers. Uh, but yeah, we're pretty lean. Yeah, there's not going to be a big data center in the future given what you guys got, but you've been successful with the cloud. Take us through how you guys laid this out, with cloud and with the hybrid solution, what are some of the things that you've implemented? What's the architecture? How does it, how does it work? Um, well, as you can imagine, a lot of our problem is managing sort of network architecture. Uh, make sure we have that laid out and that, you know, the data, one of the key things is for us is um, the data centers and the cloud talking to each other, you know, as with any hybrid solution. Um, so we spend a lot of time um, with automation. You know, one of the challenging things with cloud is uh, your first instinct is just get things up. And so you immediately just start going into consoles and start spinning things up, and the next thing you know, you've got a huge mess, right? Um, and your ability to get things working or scale, you know, you realize you have to kind of start again or you're constantly working around the problem you created. So we've invested a lot of time in um, ramping up our automation, making sure every part of the system is well-defined, well-understood, um, that we have the networking set up you know, the way we need yeah. to so the data centers can talk to each other. Um, and then also, you know, a key part of the decision in a hybrid model is what's in the cloud and what's not, right? So for us, managing the TV signal, we have, we're basically transcoding uh, incoming signals 24 seven. You know, so that's one area where if you look at cloud pricing, that's not the most effective thing to do, uh, is to have 24 seven, you know, content going in and out. Yeah. So that's you know the type of thing we look at. Okay, we're going to do that. And plus, you got a geography business. challenge, so that's an easy check. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, but you might be tempted to say, let's put all the transcoding in the cloud because scale yeah. and blah 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 blah. But if you really look at the other factors, like 
how is that going to slow down your network, your ability to deliver streams, your cost effectiveness? Um, that's just where you start to say, okay, that software is going to stay here, this software is going yeah. to go there. And that's a latency concern, and cost, both, or? Uh, definitely latency. You know, we pride ourselves on how quickly we go from over the air to someone's phone. Yeah. I mean, if you compare That's our, table stakes for you, that's like yes. your core app. Yes, <laughs> I mean, we're 30 seconds to a minute faster than Hulu or any of those people as far as our streams going live. Um, and then the other table stakes, because we're lean, is managing our costs and, you know, it's obviously, piping all of that into the cloud for us is not cost effective. Um, and then we also looked at other third party services like analytics, um, so our services that manage events and things like that that are core to your app of mm -hmm. you know getting metrics or who's watching your app, how are they watching it, what device are they watching it on, what time are they watching it. You know, so we looked at different solutions and um, that was again a place where the cloud solution ended up matching our requirements and from a pricing perspective just made a lot of sense for us versus some other third party or rolling around, right? So if cost's not an issue, is if it's centralized, you put it in the cloud because you take care of the geographies, that's key to, yeah. with the TV signals and whatnot. And then cloud, if the price is right and matches the requirements, manage it within the Amazon. Yeah. yeah. And Amazon's your cloud, right? Yes, that's right. Okay. That's right. Um, okay, so stepping back for a second, you mentioned networking, because I think one of the things I'm hearing in a lot of these conversations with uh, friends and practitioners who are doing some cutting edge work is, you know, they stay with the holy trinity of the three, the three horsemen, or if you will. Storage, compute, and networking. Yeah. The game doesn't change. It's still going to, no matter what <laughs> people say about storage being dead, yeah. it's never going to be dead, right? Yeah. Those things will change, though. Yeah. So the question I have for you, Dan, is what's the impact that cloud has had on network? As, as the, I mean, compute's pretty straightforward. You can know what compute is. You throw money at compute, you can have spin up stuff so it scales. That's beautiful thing. Storage, mm -hmm. some visibility on storage, some work to be done there, but network has always been a problem. Do you start with networking first? How does cloud? and cloud native and those services impact networking? Uh, well, it's one of those areas, um, you know, like, actually like all of those areas, I guess, but network uh, certainly, where there's really no replacement for expertise and really understanding how does this work? You know, and, and then being able to apply that to, okay, well what does, say in our case, like Amazon provide as far as how much uh, bandwidth can we get in and out, right? And then planning, okay, and how do I manage my hops, you know, if I'm going to go build my VPC and my network layout, um, and how that's all going to go from, we're getting a signal over here and it's going to hop, 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 hop. Yeah. You know, what are those hops and how do we get the most bang for buck out of that? And make sure that that's, there's as little latency between each of those as possible. Mm -hmm. And that's something where you just have to have the networking experience to understand what are all the variables um, you know, because there's a lot of um, levers you can pull in the cloud, you know. They give you a lot of options, which is a blessing and a curse, right? It, it's not just push a button and it's magically the perfect solution. You have to really go in and understand what are all those things you can tweak, including what type of instance you choose, which can affect your network bandwidth as well as your processing power, right? So, I mean, you really have to dig into those things, but, um, I would say for most companies, you know, Amazon or someone like that is still investing way more effort than you're ever likely to yeah. in making sure the network and the infrastructure is solid. And they're more invested in doing it because they have to support all these customers yeah. on it and they all have to be happy, yeah. right? Yeah. So. Um, they know they have to address it. It's, it's, exactly, it's evolution. Exactly, yeah. uh, you know, and um, yeah, and you may have special needs where there's options they provide where maybe you pay more to get higher performance if you need that. But I would say, you know, for, certainly for some a company like us, there's no way we're going to spend as much effort, you know, trying to get yeah. the data center up with the big pipes and everything else that yeah. you have. Um, you just got to make sure that you don't shoot yourself in the foot by configuring it wrong. Yeah. Right. And that's really the key. I mean, provisioning, configuration, human error. These are all things. I mean, people also. You know, said about Amazon early on, oh, security in the cloud sucks, now it's better in security. I mean, the head of the CIA said on the record, my worst day of security in the cloud is better than my best day on premises. Yeah. And so there's getting, there's a kind of scale of things. But at the end of the day, packets are packets and you go from point A to point B. That's right. That networking, that's, right. that's never going to change. So the, your point about serviceability and programmability comes up. So you guys are living the DevOps ethos because you have to. Yes. And you're building that into your entire plan. And this is kind of where I see this next level evolution where networks are programmable. 
So what does that look like, right? Is that just configuring configuration management, things from those these tr early tripwires, or configuration yeah. management, yeah. monitoring, easy ones. What's next? What's programmable networking mean for a cloud architect? Because that seems to be an open question right now. What's your thoughts to that? Um, I mean, if you're talking about a system like Amazon, or I assume like Azure or Google, I mean, a lot of that is there. I mean, where you see like the security issues, for example, or you know, is where people didn't really make the effort to understand how to lock that down, or they couldn't figure it out, and things weren't working. They said, all right, open the world, whatever. You know, but if you look at like managing security groups, we spend a lot of time managing security groups, who can talk to who. You know, make sure only the people that can talk to each other are supposed to talk to each other. Um, and, th and that's really where I think a system like Amazon will again do that better than you can without a lot of effort, which is they sort of boil it down to just say, this person can talk to this person on this port yeah. and we'll do the rest. You know, we'll manage firewalls and make sure they, yeah. the, you know, the ports can talk to each other, whatever, but you just have to tell us they can <laughs> and we'll worry about what happens underneath, right? And so I think you get a lot of that already. Mm -hmm. You know, you just have, to, again, it's one of those things where you can shoot yourself in the foot. Uh, you can bang your head against the wall a lot of why can't these things talk to each other? Um, but at the end of the day, I'd rather they couldn't talk to each other than um, it was too open or, right. It's interesting, you know, you look at like um, the networking thing at the end of the day, if you make it programmable, it just has to work, right? And yeah. I think that brings up, you know, the trade-offs operationally, and as you guys grow your operation, what are some of the operational factors that you, when you look at, you know, the dots you're connecting with your business as you guys grow um, on operations? Is it trade-off of cost and performance? Because obviously you have performance issues on the app because mm -hmm. you're streaming to the TV, but you mentioned yeah. costs. How are you balancing those trade-offs, and what do you look for um, you know, operationally to, to, to evaluate the trade-off? Um, I think a lot of time it comes from what do we want our core competencies to be? You know, is it worth it for us to build this ourselves or develop that skill set? Uh, and then you trade that off of um, what would it cost us to build it ourselves or use Amazon solution or use some other third party solution, right? Um, and then it really comes down to, even if that's more expensive, do we really yeah. want to build it ourselves, even though that might be cheaper? Is mm -hmm. that really worth it to us? Yeah. Right? Uh, it's not a core competency, and if you can get it out in the web, why not? Yeah, so yeah. for example, you know, what's in our data centers, our transcoding stack, all of that, yes, we do that ourselves. We don't use Amazon's transcoders, all of that, because that's just key to our business, and it's important that we manage that very tightly and it does what we want. And it's also just much more cost effective because of what we're doing. We're not just yeah. transcoding a code. It's your competitive advantage. That's yes, what you guys exactly. are banking on as IEP. Exactly. Uh, but managing the network infrastructure, no. <laughs> um, you know, spinning up Docker containers, yeah. no. You know, we're happy to shell that off to Amazon and just, you know. I was talking it. to a network buddy the other day and he's like, John, what's the big thing with cloud? What's, the, what's in it for me? I go, yeah. here's, the, here's the modernization of, of cloud. You are a command line guy. Command line interface is over. Because if you want to go cloud, you're going you're to be dashboard driven. You're going to be looking at a much more operator role, less of a go in and go do more command line interface, configure these switches, do these things. It kind of connect the dots for him. And he goes, okay, then this next question, I'll, which I'll ask you is, um, he goes, how do you evaluate cloud service provi cloud providers? I mean, what are, what's the criteria? Um, because Amazon's got the most services yes. that have been around mm -hmm. the longest, but Google's got great AI, and Azure's got Azure stuff. So I mean, I'm yeah, <laughs> trying to find some <laughs> some some strengths here, but yeah. uh, they got Microsoft Office, okay, and some other things. Um, but what? How would you evaluate if you're going to go back to if you had a bank off again today? Yeah. How would you advise friends to in terms of what to look for in a cloud provider? Um, well, I think obviously maturity. This is something. This is not something you change your mind about six months from now, right? If you're going to pick a cloud provider and start deploying on it, that's an investment. Like you have to be willing to live with that decision for years, likely, right? Before, if you picked wrong, it was painful enough, you might make the switch, right? So I think you definitely have to do the due diligence on, does it do what I need it to do? You know, so for us, that's not just networking and infrastructure, that's what other service do they have? So for example, you know, the database supports we use, uh, we use their eventing supports, you know, so we can send metrics, we use Redshift for, you know, big data storage. Um, so you kind of have to look at what does your product need now or in the future, and uh, what do we get, is it worth it? 
you know, and you're never going to get everything, but you may find that one gives you 80% and the other one gives you 60, another one gives you 30, mm -hmm. one gives you office, whatever that, you know. <laughs> um, and then also like integration, you know, you want to look at what else might I want to integrate with and what does that look like? You know, so for example, you know, um, having done a lot of technology evaluations, that's a big key is, well, we're going to plop this not just by itself and it's going to solve everything. We're going to have 10 other things that integrate with it. And how mature is that ecosystem? Yeah. Right. And then you have to tie it to the core competency, which you mentioned earlier. Core competency. And then you look at other higher level things um, like what a support looks like. You know, if somebody goes down in the middle of the night, am I going to be able to talk to someone who can help me out? You know, so there's a lot of things yeah. that um, if you get to sort of the higher level of decision making, mm -hmm. you really have to consider of this is a bet for the product to be up 24-7 mm -hmm. that people are going to rely on. And that's a serious, you want to take a real deep dive and you know look at it. Right? Dan, we were talking before we came on camera here about you know, Kubernetes and containers. Yeah. You had mentioned there's been some homegrown versions of containers. The containers have been around for a while. Yeah. Um, but now more than ever, you're seeing that as kind of a linchpin for a, tr a track towards microservices, which is the path towards serverless and all this greatness of that the cloud can bring with cloud native, if you're yeah. ready for it. Yeah. So the question I have for you is, uh, if for folks that are looking at containers and Kubernetes, what in those technologies, what should they look, what should they look for there? Obviously maturity is one, Kubernetes, thank God, has now kind of become a de facto standard. Yeah. But you still can pull that down and run it in your own Kubernetes, do you use Amazon? So what should um, folks, practitioners look for in the technologies behind containers and Kubernetes? Um, I think it, well, I mean, at this point, like you said, uh, uh, there used to be about half a dozen different container management uh, systems, and I'm sure they're still out there, but more or less Kubernetes has one. You know, if you can go to any cloud provider, um, they will have Kubernetes support. Um, and then there's a pretty big ecosystem around Kubernetes now. Uh, so you're really looking at um, what's going to help me deploy my software the easiest. Right, you know, a lot of people are still using packages and things like that. And I think a lot of the reason for the adoption of containers is not just, hey, it's another packaging system, um, but it has the advantages, uh, kind of like virtual machines. And I think everybody loved virtual machines for the right reasons. Uh, but where containers kind of took over is they're more lightweight, um, you know, virtual machines, because they are an entire hosted operating system, they have a lot of overhead. Right, and you have to really reserve, you know, resources and things like that. That's you, you know, for that world. And they served the purpose at that time. Exactly. Right. Um, but the same concept of having an isolated package that I can just install on machine and it works, you know, still holds true. And that's what Container provides, but with a much smaller footprint, you know, where you can uh, run them without all the extra overhead and all the extra stuff that's in between a virtual machine and its host, right? So I think they serve that container as just sort of the next evolution of the virtual machine. Uh, and then where something like Kubernetes comes in is sort of similar like where a VMware would have been where you can sort of put your services in a repository and then say, look, here's a bunch of hosts, go figure it out. Right, which once you get to scale, that's really where you want to be. You know, if you're still micromanaging how many instances you have, you're not going to scale. You're not ready for Kubernetes, basically what you're saying. So, Kubernetes, no. so there's, a, there's a, a tipping point Kubernetes, what is that tipping point? What's the scale, what's just order of magnitude, general general view on your uh, I would say, well, I mean, if you're talking about containers, if you're already sort of in the yeah. container world, you know, that tipping point uh, for that, or say Amazon's container service is sort of day one. You know, don't start deploying containers manually, that's just crazy, figure this out, right? And, you know, even if you configure it to say, you're only going to be two, and I'll worry about auto-scaling later, at least you have that foundation yeah. Uh, and you know where your containers go and you know who someone's managing the host for you instead of you going, I'm going to go to host X and tell it to run container Y yeah. and I have to do that all manually because now you've sort of gone back to the stone ages of operational deployment yeah. of where I'm going to log in and install a package and do everything manually, right? Yeah. So I think- And nobody wants that by nobody, the way. Nobody should want that. <laughs> if you do, please, please don't work. I don't know what to <laughs> yeah, say. Don't show up. Don't show up. Don't, don't show up. <laughs> or buy short to stock or whatever company yes, it is. Yes, exactly. Uh, so I think, yeah, if you're going to go the container model, you want to go figure that out and get the expertise and get that set up. Mm -hmm. You know, and again, even if you are not going to use all the bells and whistles right away, um, 
There's a lot of, like with any technology, a lot of quirks and challenges with managing containers, um, like managing networking of, you know, how does this request go from someone's browser to this container running on this mm -hmm. host, you know, inside a container, you know, and that's not trivial, yeah. right? Um, so having something like Kubernetes that just sort of handles that, mm -hmm. uh, not that Kubernetes doesn't have its own quirks and challenges to get it set up and running, um, but the whole point of that system is to deal with that, yeah. of give me a cluster of hosts and I will help you just load balance and deal with this stuff. So Dan, final question for you. Uh, you've been in the industry a long time. You've seen the waves of innovation. Uh, you had a um, stellar career as um, head of engineering, VP of engineering. At Digi, VP of engineering, CTO. Um, again, growing startups and your, and your DevOps, you're, you're lean and mean um, and growing, so that's cool. Not the big IT shop. Um, but as the world changes, what are you most excited about now? Because you've seen the movie before. You've seen the old days, you saw the transition, yeah. you've seen what cloud is bringing, obviously you're on top of it here. Um, what's exciting about this time right now? What are you excited about? Um, well, I think what's exciting is that you're seeing a lot more technologies that enable companies to scale and grow, right? Because, I mean, the hardest thing any company, like once you get past Geez, even like 30, 50 people, you know, if your company's that, getting that big, um, you start to see people, the technology start to trip over, right? Uh, you really start to see the issues of, oh crap, we got a spike and the whole service went down, or whatever that is, or a database fell over. You know, and so the fact that it's much easier and less effort to access technologies that allow you to scale, granted you have to make the effort to, mm -hmm learn how to use them, but the fact that they exist versus go roll your own of everything, yeah. I think is exciting. Um, and I think, you know, on the same, uh, on the same track, you know, the availability of these uh, scalable data stores like Aurora or Redshift or whatever, um, where you used to, again, just have to figure that out yourself. And I mean, storage is the biggest pain for scaling. That's the first thing that dies horribly, right? So just the fact that things like those are available and managed for you, you know, um, I think will help make a lot of companies be successful where, you know, three, four, or five years ago, that wasn't available, yeah. you know, and you would have had to figure it out yourself and just fallen over. And you know, the upshot too is, you know, when, you, when you're building all, when you're a builder like yourself, when you're building stuff and deploying, you can do more with 20 people on a team. Oh yeah. I mean, yeah. just think about the productivity. Yeah. I mean, think about, what you do with 20 now with cloud that you'd have to ramp up to and fundraise for. You know, build out the data center, get the QA department, get the engineering. I mean, massive yeah. amounts of overhead oh, and yeah. time loss. Well, you don't need three DBAs anymore, right? Um, so absolutely, you know, what we can do with, you know, a 10 person team today is, you know, massive. You know, compared to what we could do five years ago, so. All right, Dan Drew, CTO, uh, Executive Vice President of Engineering at a company called Didja, D-I-D-J-A TV. Check them out. Hot startup doing a really amazing mission, trying to bring uh, over-the-air TV to local communities on an app with programming. Certainly, guys, if any, any Cube content you want, feel free to use all of our free content. Uh, happy to, to donate the Cube content to the Digi mission. Thanks for coming on, appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Okay, Dan Drew here inside the Cube. I'm John Furrier with the Cube Conversation here in our Palo Alto studios for the Cube. Thanks for watching.